And so this morning we come to the book of Hosea again. If you do not have a sermon outline, these fine gentlemen would love to give you one. Everyone needs one, especially this morning as we continue our study of the book of Hosea. If you're joining us online, we want you to know that there is a button you can click below this message where you can actually download the the notes as well. We study the Bible at our church because we believe that these are the words of God and that He wants us to know Him. He wants us to know Him fully. And so He has given us a beautiful word for this. In fact, this morning you see the title of the message is No Word of God, No Walk with God. And the point is, what we are going to see in this passage of Scripture is that if we do not have His Word, we cannot walk with Him. And we see this played out in the story of Hosea. Now, we have embarked upon a study of a book of the Bible that has some of the most glorious, tender, loving statements in it of all of Scripture. In fact, I have been guilty of going through the book of Hosea and just finding those sweet gems and holding on to those gems while skipping over other portions of the book that are more difficult. And so this morning, we're not going to do that. This morning, we are going to look at the difficult nature of it as we look at the sin of Israel and the wrath that God's, that God's justice would be brought about upon their sin. And so let's review a little bit. If you're new to us this morning, I say to you, this is so important. The review is important because you're going to say, well, why are passages on sin and wrath important to us? I, I kind of like the Christianity light, kind of like Bud Light or the Christianity or whatever. I like Christianity light um, on this. Well, no, let's, you know, let's, let's look carefully at his word. Notice the paragraph that is just under this, underneath that statement. While the book of Hosea has some astounding statements about God's love and forgiveness, the majority of Hosea is revealing sin and declaring God's wrath against it, like a lot of the Bible. So, is it really necessary to study the sin and wrath stuff? If so, why? It's an honest question. We answered that last week, and these five points are from last week. Let's remember what we said. We said, first of all, because every last word, fill that in, every last word of God's holy word is eternally important. It was so strange. This yesterday, I opened the mailbox, and in my mailbox at home was this magazine, called Decision Magazine from Billy Graham's Ministry. So I get one once every couple of months or something. I guess it's every month. And the entire issue, look what the entire issue is devoted to, discarding the Old Testament. My friends, in our Christianity-like culture, we see a movement even among evangelical Christians of not recognizing the importance of what is three-quarters of the Bible. We see people saying, well, you know, that's Old Covenant, and Jesus brought the New Covenant, and what in the world would we really want to study the Old Covenant for? And we, and we, we don't see all of the glory and the majesty of who God is and His holiness that He shows that we need to see throughout the Old Testament, and the glory of the New Testament as we study it. You cannot understand the New Testament without understanding the Old Testament. The Old Testament is the, uh, the veiling of the coming of Christ, and the New Testament is the revealing of that Christ who would come. And so we see the, the importance of this. It reminded me of our illustrious third president, Thomas Jefferson. And you maybe know that Thomas Jefferson was a brilliant mind, um, but in his latter years, as he was Um, very, very educated and very, very philosophical in many things, he took a razor to six Bibles. He had six Bibles, and he went through and he excised the passages that he didn't like, the passages that he felt like were, were not really part of the true gospel. So he went through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and he came up with his own version of it after he had cut out 
the portions he didn't like, and he compiled um, one that he would say the true life and message um, of the life and morals of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, my friends, Thomas Jefferson, great legal mind, great philosophical mind, but as a deist and not as a Christian, he missed the glorious nature of who Jesus really was and what he really came to do. He didn't come to be a moral teacher in itself. He came to be the great sacrifice of God so that we may be made right with God, not through our adherence to a moral code, but through our faith in a loving and gracious God who gives himself. So, every last word is important. Notice number two here. Um, the other reason we need to study sin and wrath is because superficial diagnoses will lead to false remedies. If you have cancer, you don't need a Band-Aid. If you, if you have a major illness that is going to take your life, you need a proper diagnosis so that you can have a proper remedy. And so what we see is when we leave out the portions of the Bible that deal with God's holiness and our sinfulness and God's judgment against that sin, we are coming up with a false diagnosis. You see, we just think we just need more encouragement. We need more to be more positive. We need to be more optimistic when what we may need to be is more honest and humble and broken before a holy God. And so, we have to have the right diagnosis. If you leave out three quarters of the Bible, you will get a poor diagnosis with a false remedy that will be very deceiving. Number three, we want you to see and understand that the reason that we pay attention to sin and wrath is because understanding sin and wrath will make you wiser. If you never look at the folly of man, if you ever look at the foolishness of our hearts and our actions that are ungodly, you will never see the wisdom of God. Number four, we need to study sin and wrath because we will be warned of great danger. You see, much of the world falls into the dangerous traps that are around them because they have not listened carefully to what God has said in His Word of what is right and what is wrong and who He is in our need. Number five, we need to study sin and wrath because it will help you cherish the gospel. It will help you have a great love for God's grace and His goodness. We saw this diagram that shows us that when we become a Christian, we may not fully understand what all has happened at that moment, but as the years go on and as you walk with the Lord and as you grow closer to Him, you start to see the enormous bridge that He has gapped between, by the cross in what the cross has done for us. We start to say, wow, He would really, a holy and righteous God would re really lay down His life for a sinful, small, insignificant person like me, we begin to see the great love of God and the great cher and we can come to cherish God. This morning, I want to additionally add a few things here about why we should study uh, sin and wrath and not ignore these passages of the Bible. And it, right there next to the word additionally, you see this. The greatest need you have is to know the God of Scripture. You and I need to know the God of Scripture, and we need to walk with Him. That is the greatest thing. More than the next breath that you have, you need to know God. More than the next paycheck that you have, more than the next meal that you would have, you need to know God and to walk with Him in this life. You see, Philippians chapter 3, verses um, 8 through 11, and this is not on your outline, but I would ask you to write that, Philippians 3, 8 through 11, off to the side there. Notice the screen in front of you. I want you to see what Paul says about knowing God and walking with Him. Look what he says in verse 8. Indeed, the Apostle Paul wrote, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of what? Knowing, knowing Christ. 
knowing Christ my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, I count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. This is to know him, to walk with him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes from the law, but that which comes from the law, that which comes through faith in Christ. The righteousness from God that depends on faith. And then look at verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings and become like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. He's saying my salvation depends upon knowing God and being with Christ, being found in Christ. As Senya said, being with my life hidden with Christ in God. Now, fill this in. You don't need a Mr. Potato Head God. Just try to remember a little bit. Did, did any of you have a Mr. Potato Head when you were a kid? How many of you had a Mr. Potato Head when you were a kid? Some of you are looking at and saying, what in the world is Mr. Potato Head? Mr. Potato Head. <laughs> Mr. Potato Head was this little piece of plastic from Taiwan that had all of these molded plastic. You had a little bin, and you had ears and eyes and noses and mouths and everything. And you can kind of select what ears, what eyes, what nose, what mouth you want to put on Mr. Potato Head. And you can create your own little creature. Now, let me just tell you that when we ignore passages of the Scripture, when we do as Thomas Jefferson, Edison, Thomas Jefferson did and go cutting up the New Testament, when we begin to, even perhaps in our own modern day, that churches start to ignore passages of the Scripture that are not so savory, that are not so encouraging, that are not so um, interesting to us, when we begin to skew our attention through preferred passages, we come up with a God who's like Mr. Potato Head. We come up with our own created God. We create a totem. We create our own idol of not the true God of Scripture. What we've said here is our greatest need is to know the God of Scripture and to walk with Him, not one that we have created by conveniently eliminating the parts of Him that we either do not understand or do not like. That is a very dangerous thing for Christians to do in this day and time. What do you mean by preferred passages? Well, you know, I love Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Or Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not calamity. To give to you a hope and a future and you will call upon me and come and pray to me and you will listen to me and you will seek me when you find me with, when you search for me with all of your heart. I love those encouraging, uplifting passages. I really do. But you know, if you just go through the Bible and find inspirational passages that you happen to like, you will have a skewed view of the true God. And ultimately, notice this, when we practice, fill this in, pick and choose Christianity, when we practice pick and choose Christianity, we deceive ourselves and the truth of God is not in us. In fact, it is a what kind of gospel? A false gospel. It's not true. You can be deceived and you can, in fact, you can go happily, joyfully, merrily to death and wake up in hell. That is a very dangerous thing that we do when we replace the God of Scripture with the God of our own desires. You see, you don't need quick fixes, Sheridan Hills. You don't need quick fixes, however enticing they may appear. What are quick fixes? Well, sometimes it's sensational emotional experiences. You, know, you come to a worship service and it, man, the lights and the fog and the, and the music and the deep beat and the whatever. I mean, it, perhaps it's just this overwhelming sensory experience or it's very dramatic and very emotional but not very deep. You, well, there are certain things that can be done. There are stories that can be told, poems that can be quoted, things that make you go, hmm. And I mean, you just, you know, before very long, how different is that with going to a drama or a play? We want to be very careful to say that uh, sensation is great and emotions are proper in the right place, 
but that is not what makes us close to God. How about intellectual stimulation? There are many Christian groups that they love to hear a sermon that makes them go, hmm, oh yes, interesting. Never thought about that before. Hmm. You know, I mean, I, I hope that that is the effect of God's Word on us, but if we are just seeking to be intellectual and philosophical and be intrigued by these things, my friends, we are missing the point of God's Word. How about emo- motivational enticement? You know, I just need a good motivation for living. You know, it's kind of Zig Ziglar, Tony Robbins Christianity. You know, that's, I mean, Zig Ziglar was a Christian, but he was mainly a motivational speaker in his professional life. I'm thankful that he would also preach the gospel of Christ. But, you know, there's some people that are just looking for their church to give them a great motivation to go to, mon- go to work Monday morning by being optimistic. Again, Many churches are built upon tips and tactics for life that, you know, we want to help you be a better you. Uh, We want you to have the seven keys to joyful living or the 10 steps to successful parenting, the 400 steps to successful parenting of teenagers, um, whatever it may be, you know, four ways to win. You know, I I don't know, but if if all you hear is how-to sermons, if all you hear is just kind of some sage wisdom on some things without the realities of our condition before God and the realities of who He really is, you will not come to know Him and you will not walk with Him. Hosea chapter 4 is one of the many passages of the Scripture that helps us start to see who God really is and who we are not. We start to see the nation of Israel in all of its folly. And we're going to move very quickly through this. I want you to see in Hosea chapter 4, in verse 1, we see that God is prosecuting His case against an unfaithful people of His. They are His people, and they've been unfaithful, and He is telling them so. Look at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. You see, He's not writing to the pagans. He's not writing to those who do not know God. He's not writing to the people, the surrounding nations. He is writing to His chosen people. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. For the Lord, underline it, has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. In what land? The promised land that he had given them, this gift that he had given them. He had brought them out of slavery in Egypt. He brings them into the promised land. And here, amidst all of these blessings, what do they keep doing? They keep running away from him. And the Lord is saying, I have a controversy with you. Look what it says in the middle of verse 1. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love. Some of your Bibles Bibles say loyalty, and that would be right. Um, There is no faithfulness or steadfast love. There is no knowledge of God in the land. You see that? The knowledge of God. We're going to see that come up over and over again in this passage. The knowledge of God. They've forgotten who God is. They don't know who He is. They have gone out, and they have pursued other gods. Look what it says in verse 2. There is swearing and lying and murder and stealing and committing adultery. They break all bounds. And Look what it says at the end of verse 2. And bloodshed follows what? Bloodshed. bloodshed. You see, this isn't just Miami um, in 2019 in South Florida. This is everywhere. And this is throughout all time. And this is even in the nation of Israel, the people that were supposed to be gods. It's one of the things I love about the Bible. It's so honest. You know, other histories, they they whitewash their history in order to make it look all pure and all right and everything else. And then you come to see, oh, well, that's not really true. The Bible doesn't do that. The Bible tells all of Israel's dirty laundry. And it tells all of their failures. And see, that's part of the big message of the Bible is that that they failed God even after all of his blessings. And God is saying, if you'll just come to me, if you'll come and listen to me, if you'll put your faith in me and not in other things, if you will love me and not the world that's around you, 
you can experience my blessings, but you keep running after other things. Look what it says in verse 3, the results of this. The land, therefore, circle the word therefore, so the reason, excuse me, the result of their not knowing God and all of their breaking of his law, therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens and even the fish of the sea are taken away. It goes on in verse 4, yet let no one contend and let none accuse, for with you is my contention, O priests. You shall stumble by day, and the prophet also shall stumble with you by night, and I will destroy your mother, right out there to the side, the nation of Israel. This isn't talking about God killing your mom, so much as this is talking about God is saying that this mother nation that you have been given is going to be destroyed. I am going to crush you because of your ungodly, unfaithful life. Now, I want you to notice some key observations as we work down through this text over here on the right-hand side. Number one, we see this is God's people, and they better listen. We would do well to listen. We would do well not to ignore His words. Look what it says in verse 1, hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. And we can say to Sheridan Hills, hear God's word. Let's not ignore it. The issue is always, fill it in, the issue is always God's word. The issue is the knowledge of Him. The issue is listening to what He has said. Look down at verse 6. Look at verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of what? Lack of knowledge. You see, when they don't know God, they're destroyed. Because what, look what it says on the next line. Because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being a priest to me. And look what it says in the bottom of verse 6. And since you have forgotten the law of your God. You see, they have rejected the knowledge of God, the law of God, listening to God in his words. We better listen to his word. That is always the issue. Number two, God in his grace identifies the problem he has with his people. He's not just being mean. He's not just being harsh. No, what he's saying to you is, let me tell you where you went wrong. Now, how many teenagers want to know where they went wrong? We often don't want to know when we're young where we're wrong. And mom and dad are ready to do what? Ready to tell them where you went wrong. Let me help you. And I I understand in a fallen world, we, we can have the wrong motives for dealing with our kids. But a good father, a good mother, a perfect heavenly father is saying, I'm going to tell you where you're wrong so you can learn more of me and you can be corrected. Notice that he identifies the problem that he has with his people. And what we find in verse 1 and 2 is we find this. And look what it says in the end of verse 1. It says, there is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. So they don't have faithfulness, they don't have steadfast love, and they don't have knowledge of God. And as a result of that, we've already pointed out, in verse 3, excuse me, in verse 2, there is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, committing adultery, and bloodshed. So, fill this in, and this is an important concept for us to get. Sins of omission, sins of omission lead to sins of commission. When we omit, we commit. When we omit to look at God's Word, when we omit to learn His ways, when we omit to spend time with Him in prayer, when we omit to come to worship, when we omit the things that we need to do in discipline to pursue the Lord as part of our part of that, when we omit that, we fall into sin. And you see that at the end of verse 1 and the beginning of verse 2. There's no faithfulness, steadfast love, no knowledge of God in the land. There's swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. When you don't do, and this is what I put down there at the bottom, when you don't do what you should do, you will do what you shouldn't do. Y'all want to try to say that out loud with me? Let's read it. When you don't do what you should do, 
you will do what you shouldn't do. So if we'll, just, if we'll just stay with the Lord, stay in worship, stay in His Word, stay in prayer, stay in communication with our family, stay in communication with our wife or our husband, if we, if we begin to just do the things that we should do, it makes it much more difficult to do all the things that we shouldn't do. Or I should say it makes it much easier to continue doing the right thing instead of running to the wrong thing. Um, There's a lot of people who simply want to stop doing certain sins without doing that which is proper and right in the things that bring strength. Simply doesn't make sense. God's grace identifies the problem, and the big problem is they neglected God's Word. They neglected to worship God, and when that happened, all hell breaks loose upon them. God's wrath and judgment comes upon them. It's unleashed in order to show them that they are wrong. Look at verse 3, or or excuse me, number 3 that is here on the right-hand side. God in His grace sends judgment to get the attention of His people. God allows the consequences of their sin, and He even invokes upon them difficulty in in order to help them see Him. And we see this in verse 3. Look what it says, therefore the land mourns, and all the people dwell in it languish, and all the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. Even the environment around them is corrupted, and God in His mercy is allowing this to happen in order to draw them to Himself. Look at number four on the right-hand side. We see this. Don't make excuses. Don't blame others or everybody else. The point is this. Look at number four. It says, yet let no one contend and let, not, and let none accuse, for with you is my contention, O priest. So, so far we've heard the problem is with the nation of Israel. We hear the problem is with the priests because they neglect the word. And then verse 5, in the priests, you're going to stumble by day in the prophet. And these are false prophets. These are bad prophets. These are the prophets of Baal worship. The prophet also will stumble with you by night, many things that they did at night. Remember we talked about the lunatics, the loon, the moon, um, the idea of what, you know, what comes out at night and all of the wickedness that comes with that very often. I mean, there's a, there's a picture of darkness and the things that are hidden in darkness. Ask the police. The police will tell you a lot of bad things happen there in the day, but some pretty wicked things happen at night. Notice here that the picture is, is that the people are a problem, the priests are a problem, they've neglected the word, and the prophets are a problem. The whole lot of them have run from God, and they have neglected the word, and the people have uh, tolerated their error. Now, number five is this on the right-hand side, and we see this. We see the potential consequences are massive, and there are some huge consequences, and, and, and I want you to see some of them. Remember with me, the nation of Israel was supposed to be God's people who would have generation after generation after generation, just, just millions of millions of inhabitants, and then we see that God is also going to bless the whole world through them. He's going to bring a Messiah through them. And we see in Hosea that that is being put in jeopardy. We see that God is saying, perhaps not. If you don't turn back, and if you're, not, if you're not restored to me, how can you be my people? Look at the bottom, some of you turned over, but look at the bottom of page one. Look where it says, the potential consequences are massive. They're cursed environment. We've already seen that in verse three. They're gonna lose their nation. The, the, the idea of you, your mother is gonna be killed. Look at this. They're gonna lose their priestly place among other nations, that all nations are not gonna be blessed through you if my judgment falls completely. Look at the next part. They lose their promised generations to come. And it's very interesting that the end of verse six where it says, I also will forget your children. It's not as if it's already happened. It's saying that this is possible. And the picture of this judgment is real. And it's to help us realize where we would be without the Lord. It's as if the Lord is saying, I want you to see how bad it can be. Now, I want you to see on the other side, it's safe to turn that over. I want us to very quickly run down and see this grand, unfolding, cascading sin problem that they have and the wrath that is going to come. 
Numbers, verses 7 through 10, and this is not a number of a point, but it is the verses 7 through 10. Do you see that paragraph? I want you to see this. This is the corrupt, ungodly priests will be judged harshly. And I want you to see this. Look at verse 7. The more they increase, the more they sinned against me, and I will change their glory to shame. So the priests really thought they were something, but now the priests are going to be shamed. The priests are going to be humbled. They feed on the sin of my people. He's saying that the priests are taking in all of these, these meats and these things that are sacrificed to idols, and they are, they are bringing in these foods, and they're feeding on this, and they are greedy for their iniquity. They want the people to continue to do more sacrifices so that they can get more kickback. These are corrupt priests in the name of God or in the name of Baal, in the name of others. Some of them um, just just very, very corrupt. Look at verse 9. And it shall be like people, like priests. I will punish them for their ways and repay them for their deeds. So just because they're a priest, they're not going to be spared. In fact, they're going to get in more trouble. Look at verse 10. They shall eat, but not be satisfied. They shall play the whore, but not multiply. So they're going to go out, and they're going to have sex, but they're not going to have children. And that's that's a great curse um, in this day and time. Because they have forsaken the Lord to cherish, and here's what they've cherished. They've cherished whoredom. They've cherished wine. They've cherished new wine, which they take, which take away the understanding. So their sin problem just compounds, and it has a lot to do with the wrong leaders. One of God's judgment upon people is giving them the wrong, giving them leaders that are ungodly. And we see this. It's a, it's a, a tit for tat, and it goes back and forth. Notice this on, over there in the blanks over there. Remember the warnings of Jesus, Paul, Peter, and Jude, that corrupt leaders have always been a problem. That is true in the Old Testament. That is true in the first century of the New Testament, and that is true today. And we see it. We see people that come in and seek to lead in the name of God for their own gain. They come in and they lead in the name of God for money, for sex, for power, for status, for control, whatever it may be. And we we see the Bible dealing very honestly with that. Notice the next part here. Their sin will be great, their damage will be great, and their condemnation will be great. So God is going to judge that. I I don't understand how people can take the gospel and twist it for their own use, for their own Learjet, or for their own adultery, or for their own whatever, and think that they're going to get away with it. And, And it's only because they've ignored passages like this, and they've ignored the book of Jude, and they've ignored the words of the Lord Jesus, who said wolves are going to come in and I'm going to get them. Notice this with me. Be careful who you follow. Just because he has religious credentials does not mean that he is a man of God. Just because she seems to be powerful and strong does not mean that she is a woman of God. And so, we must be careful who we follow. Look at the next part, verses 12 through 14. My people inquire of a piece of wood. What does that mean? My people inquire of a piece of wood. Can you write above the word wood an idol? So they have this carved wood. Their walking sticks give them oracles. So it's kind of the, you know, and and they're, they're going to get out a message of their walking stick which is supposed to be a staff to guide and to guard sheep, but yet it's being turned to bring about some type of occult worship. For a spirit of whoredom has led them astray, and they have left their God to play the whore. Underline that, left their God. They've left their God to play the whore. Verse 13, they sacrifice on the tops of mountains and burnt offerings on the hills under oak, poplar, and terebinth because their shade is good. So they're, they're doing all these occultic practices either in high places or hidden under the trees. Notice the next part there. 
Therefore, your daughters play the whore, your brides commit adultery. Verse 14 is interesting. I will not punish your daughters when they play the whore or your brides when they commit adultery for the men themselves go aside with prostitutes and sacrifice with cult prostitutes and a people without understanding shall come to ruin. Now, I want you to notice a few things in this, and you can study it on your own, but look over there to the right-hand side. Verses 12 through 14, we see the stupidity of their, idol, of their idolatry. They're talking to pieces of wood. They're listening to oracles from a stick. We see the sadness of their idolatry. They trade a piece of wood for God. They left their God to play the whore. We see the perversion of their idolatry. That means that they're, they're doing all these Baal worship things that were very sexual, and it's just perverted. And it was even involved child sacrifice. Perverted, horrible things. And notice the depth of their idolatry. They just, they just, they kept going headlong into sin. Wives and daughters and husbands and, and sons and day after day going into the sin that would draw them away from God. And then we see the end of their idolatry, that they wind up, look at the bottom of verse 14, what does it say? A people without understanding shall what? Underline that, come to ruin. They're destroyed. And that is always the case where wickedness increases, destruction eventually comes. Now, verses 15 and 16 are a huge warning. Fill that in. They're a huge warning, and the idea is stay away from this evil. Look at 15 and 16. Though you play the whore, O Israel, let not Judah become guilty. You remember Judah was the southern kingdom. That's not Israel. That's Judah. And, and you're saying, don't let Judah, who's not been unfaithful yet, don't let them come near you. Enter not into Gilgal, nor up to beth Aven. And swear not as the Lord lives. Like a stubborn heifer, Israel is stubborn. Can the Lord now feed them like a lamb in a broad pasture? The idea is it's a big open space. The Lord wants to lead them to good grass, but they take off in the broad pasture. They won't stay with the shepherd. They won't benefit from his wisdom. They won't benefit from what he, what he knows. They can't follow him to green pastures and still waters, like Psalm 23 says. Instead, they run away from their God, and they bear the consequences of that. So look at 15 and 16 and fill this in. Warning, stay away from this evil. Faithful Judah was to keep a distance. Gilgal was a holy place to God, and the idea is it had been turned into a wicked place, Beth Avon is very interesting. That was called Bethel, the house of God. But here it's as if um, the Lord through a Hosea is mocking them. And he's saying, it was supposed to be the house of God, but you guys have made it Beth Avon, the house of wickedness. See, this is what happens. S Israel is squaring in this, saying, I mean, w with that idea, as the Lord lives, it's in this day and time, it's like when somebody says, honest to God, honest to God. You better be careful about honest to God. That is, that is like a swear um, that is saying, um, I'm not lying. And very often, people would say that when they were lying. Israel simply will not be helped. You see that at the end? It's like the stubborn calf. It's like the stubborn heifer that runs away. They won't come to the Lord. They won't be helped. They're just so in their sin and so in their folly. Look at 17 through 19. Ephraim is Israel, and it's used 38 times in the book of Hosea. It's the largest tribe in Israel, and so he uses the Ephraim uh, tribe as the depiction of the rest of Israel, and it's kind of laying the blame on that tribe, but it's really encompassing all of them. And the bottom line is, and we see it in verse 17 is, fill this in, their wickedness is to the core. And that's, that's part of the important of us, importance of us studying all of the Bible because we begin to see how our wickedness, it goes all the way down into the heart of our sinful fallen flesh. 
And this is why we need a savior. This is why we can never save ourselves. This is why moralistic therapeutic deism is not the answer. This is why we need the compassionate grace of God who would come and pay for the sins of his people. Look what it says in verse 17. Ephraim is joined to idols. Circle the word joined. It's like they're they're infused, they're grafted into the idols. They've grown together. It's so wicked. So Israel has, has joined to the idols. Leave him alone. It's like it's, it's just too far. When their drink is gone, they give themselves to whoring. So they run out of the alcohol, then they go after the women or go after the men. Their rulers, look at this, dearly love what? Shame. Friends, they, they just love the sin. And they shout it from the mountaintops. They declare it as the, that which is evil, they declare it to be righteous. And that which is righteous, they declare to be evil. They're proud of their sin. They love their shame. Look at verse 19. A wind has wrapped them in its wings, and they shall be ashamed because of their sacrifices. Friends, the Bible is showing us that in ourselves and in our sin, in our loving the world, we are choosing, picking and choosing or neglecting altogether the Word of God, that we are wicked to the core. Now that, some people say, I don't like that message. Why would you tell a room full of 600 people you're wicked to the core? My friends, I'm not telling you that. The Bible is telling you that. You got a problem with God's message, not my message. We need to see this so we are not deceived into into thinking that we are inherently good and able to save ourselves. Look at the concluding thoughts with me. And there's so many things. And this is is why this passage matters when you're raising your, your fourth grader and your third grader. If you will apply the reality of this depth of our, of our need for God to your fourth grader and your fifth grader or to your 23-year-old or to your 36-year-old and you begin praying in line with what we see man's need, we can apply God's word to our lives. And here's some of the concluding thoughts on this. Number one, and some of you have heard something along these lines before, sin will take you further than what? you want to go. And that's what we see with the nation of Israel. They started out small, and then they got to where they were sinning bigger and bigger and bigger. Sin will take you further than you want to go. It will keep you longer than you want to stay, and it will cost you more than you want to pay. That's what sin does. And you know, we, you can find that out in the, across the street. You can find that out if you interview f- folks right here in this room who've been there, and some that are there right now, they're sitting there dealing with a world of hurt and a world of thing, and they, they know this is because I've neglected God. I've neglected paying, paying attention to him. I've neglected listening to him, and here I am sitting in it. And it's kept me longer than I want to stay. And I'm paying an enormous price that is very painful. And, and I can tell you, it's not just the guys down at the Broward County Jail or the Miami Detention Center. I mean, it's, it's not just them. Though they will usually tell you, yeah, I got wrapped in. I got pulled in. And I've paid far more than I want to pay. You see, all of this came about because God's people, look at this, all of this came about because God's people got separated from his word. When we neglect God's word, all hell breaks loose. And quite literally, there is hell to pay. Quite literally. 
And so the Bible is God's warning to us. He's warning us, don't be someone who loves the world, who loves the idols of the world, who loves your flesh. Sure, all of this may be pleasurable for a moment, or the drunkenness may relieve your pain for a moment, or the sexual appetite. Some of these things may be a short-lived hit. But oh, dear friend, God is saying, I am so much better. If you'll come and love me instead of loving the world, if you'll come and worship me instead of worshiping the world, you will be saved from this. And I have made it for you to be able to see that you cannot keep the law, that I will send one who will be the perfect satisfaction for the law, and that would be the Lord Jesus Christ. And that where you should have been nailed to the cross, he was nailed to the cross. The sinless son of God, fulfilling the demands of the law so that we might go free. What a glorious truth. So how do we apply this really? I mean, I've mentioned it all the way through, but I, I just want to, in case you haven't figured it out, let's just, let's just say it here. The idols of entertainment of media, of sports, of work, of leisure, of status, of sex, of physique, of food or health, and we could go on and on and on, can keep you just as far from God as Baal worship. You see, we would be, don't fold anything over. I want you to look at this. We need to understand that these things aren't necessarily bad unless your life loves them more than you love God. And when you begin to love these things, when you begin to love yourself in the fulfillment of your own flesh more than you love God, that is when you are worshiping other gods. We need to be careful to say, oh Lord God, Cause me to see where my heart worships and what my heart worships. That I would see that if I am not in your word, I will be drawn away and worship other gods. If there's no word of God in your life, there will be no walk with God. If you have a little green pen, some of you see the pens in the pews. Saw Psalm 119, 107. How do we get revived? How do we come back to God? The only way that we do that is through His Word. His Word is what corrects us. His Word is what accuses us and convicts us. But then His Word is also what restores us. In fact, Jesus said, I am the living Word. He is the Word of truth that comes and sets us free. Amen? Would you please stand with me as we pray?